Welcome to All Ages Driving School. I'm Mr. James, and today we're going to be doing Day 8 of Teen Driver's Ed Distant Learning Course. So let's get started. All right, so today we're going to be watching a great video called the Four Driving Skills for Life video. We're going to be focusing on visualization skills, such as, such as SIPDE, which stands for Search, Identify, Predict, Decide, and Execute. Now on day 10, we're going to go real deep into that SIPDE process, but today we're going to be watching a video that's going to help you visualize and understand what to look for when dealing with hazards out there on the roadway, especially as a teen. And we're also going to focus on what maneuvers we need to make in dangerous situations such as skids and oncoming vehicles. So let's go ahead and get started with that video. All your life you've been waiting to get out on the open road, but once you get behind the wheel, that open road can turn into an obstacle course. Take a look for yourself. How many potential driving hazards can you see? Welcome to the real world of driving. And real world driver. I'm Stefan. And I'm Kay Franchelle. You know, driving is not a game. It's for real. And in this video, we're going to show you some driving skills that can make a real difference when you take to the road. Go! Here's a scary fact. Crashes are the number one killer of American teenagers, and more than half of teen drivers will be involved in a crash before age 20. To find out why, the experts who created this video study teen drivers and the circumstances involved in teen crashes. They learned that teens face the greatest risk during their first few weeks behind the wheel. In fact, your crash risk drops by half after your first few hundred miles on the road. That's because by then, you've started developing the skills to handle real-world driving situations. Well, why wait? We're going to show you the skills you need now. Skills that our experts identified as the critical factor in more than 60% of teen crashes. We can't teach you these skills. For that, you need a parent or driving instructor who can take you out on the road. But we can help you get started. That's right. Hi, I'm Scott. Real World Driver concentrates on four essential skill sets. We'll be looking at the hazard recognition skills. You need to drive safely through intersections, avoid distractions, and scan for trouble. Vehicle handling skills that can help you stay in control on the road and stop safely with different braking systems. Space management skills you can use to maintain a margin of safety, whether you're moving in traffic or coming to a stop. And speed management skills that can help you adjust your speed to road conditions and recover safely in a skid. And at our website, we can help you test your driving know-how with an online quiz that rewards top scores with instant prizes. So, ready for a ride into the real world? First, two quick reminders. Always buckle up, whether you're driving or only going along for the ride. And never take the wheel if you're not totally alert. Drowsiness and drinking are both deadly on the road. In the real world, your survival depends on staying alert and being on the lookout for trouble. That's why we're going to start this video by talking about hazard recognition. A hazard is any difficult or dangerous driving situation. And we've already seen there are all sorts of hazards to watch out for when you're driving. We're going to look at some of the more dangerous hazards, intersections, and distractions, and find out what you can do to spot hazards before they turn into trouble. Here's the number one hazard you can expect to see every time you take to the road. In fact, you can't avoid it. Intersections. 25% of American driving fatalities occur at intersections, and there are about 600,000 injury-producing crashes at intersections each year. That's why to get through intersections safely, you need the know-how to spot hazards and react safely. Let's start with approaching an intersection. First thing to do, check for a traffic signal. If you see a stop sign, you know you're going to stop. Same thing if you see a red or yellow light. But what if the light is green? You know it could turn yellow at any second, and you don't want to risk getting caught in an intersection. So what are you supposed to do? It's a tricky problem. So when you're approaching a green light, get into the habit of asking yourself, if it changes now, will I stop or go? The answer depends partly on the traffic behind you. So keep checking to be sure you can stop without getting rear-ended. 
As you get closer to the green light, you'll eventually come to a point where you've gone too far to stop safely. That's called the point of no return. We passed the point of no return for this intersection, so we cruise on through. With practice, you'll be able to find the point of no return in any intersection, and you'll learn how it can change depending on traffic and driving conditions. OK, we talked about approaching intersections. Now let's look at the intersection itself. When you're in an intersection, you should always scan for trouble. It's just like looking both ways before you cross the street. Scan left, center, right, before you enter the danger zone. Scan left because a driver coming from that direction would hit you first. Scan the center for a vehicle stopped ahead of you or turning left toward you. Scan right for a driver turning right on red. Remember, left, center, right. Whether you're alone at the intersection or in a line of traffic, don't count on the other guy to watch out for you. When you're in the danger zone, you need to be in control. And here's a tip for handling one of the biggest hazards at intersections, left turn. Watch. Turning left at an intersection takes planning, positioning, and patience. It's a high-risk maneuver that's involved in more than 60% of intersection crash injuries, so you want to get it right. First, planning. As you approach the intersection, check for lane and traffic control signs. Then turn on your left turn signal and steer into the turning lane. Now get in position for a safe left turn. When you move into the intersection, wait just past the crosswalk, like this and keep your wheels straight. That way, you won't be pushed into the oncoming traffic if someone rear-ends you. Last, be patient. Don't try to dash through a gap in the traffic. Remember, you can always wait until the light turns yellow and make your turn once the oncoming traffic is stopped. And while you're waiting, always check to your left and make sure the street you're turning onto is clear. No pedestrians in the crosswalk, no other vehicles blocking your path. Planning, positioning, and patience. That's the way to make a safe left turn. OK, we've seen how intersections are full of hazards. Now, let's look at a type of hazard that hits closer to home. Distractions. Here's an example. <laughs> Get the idea? Anything that can cause you to take your eyes off the road is a potential hazard. And the risk is even greater if you're a beginning driver. That's what the experts learned at Ford Vertex Lab, where they use an advanced driving simulator to study distractions. Many people have thought that because teenagers just grow up with cell phones, that they're so used to it and they're so good at it, that it isn't really as much of a problem for them as it is for adults when they drive. And we found from our research that that just isn't true. More than half the time that something dramatic and potentially dangerous happens in front of them in traffic, they don't see it while they're dialing a handheld phone. Bottom line? Tests show that cell phones are a dangerous distraction when you're driving, no matter how much experience you have on the road. And it's not just cell phones. You can be distracted by the CD player, the radio, the food you're eating, even a friend, especially a friend. Studies show that just one passenger doubles your chances of a fatal crash. With two or more passengers, the risk is five times higher. But remember, you can control these types of hazards. Turn off your cell phone. You can always check for messages later. Don't fiddle with the radio or fumble with a fresh CD. And don't eat food when you're driving. And don't let your passengers distract you. Not even a friend. Because it could be the end of a beautiful friendship. So that leaves us with hazards that can pop up anywhere. And you've already seen there are plenty of them out there. It takes real skill to handle a hazard-filled stretch of road like this one. To start with, you have to maintain a safety zone around your vehicle. That's the space you need to stop or steer away from trouble. In this vehicle, traveling at 30 miles per hour, it takes about 33 feet to stop. Here's the same vehicle traveling at 60 miles per hour. Now it takes nearly 114 feet to stop. In other words, at twice the speed, you need a safety zone almost four times larger. Spotting hazards before they pop up in your safety zone takes skill, concentration, and practice. Just watch. When you're behind the wheel, you have to scan the road constantly, moving your eyes every couple of seconds to glance ahead, behind, and side to side. Eye movement is important because you can't really recognize a hazard until you glance directly at it, and you can't afford to take your eyes off the safety zone in front of you for more than a second. 
With practice, you'll learn to focus your glance on trouble spots that could suddenly turn into hazards. For example, parked cars that might pull away from the curb or open the door, road signs and traffic signals that change the flow of traffic, other drivers maneuvering around you or changing speed, driveways from which a car or truck might come backing out. But remember, you have to spot hazards before they pop up in your safety zone. That means using what's called minimum eye lead time to open up your scanning range. On city streets, you should be scanning 12 to 15 seconds ahead. That's about a city block. We'll have more on this later when we talk about safe following distances. At highway speeds, open it up to 20 or 30 seconds down the road. And whatever your speed, stay alert, because hazards can pop up anywhere. OK, so let's review. We looked at the skills you need to avoid hazards at intersections. And we looked at the common sense skills you can use to avoid hazardous distractions. Then we saw how scanning skills can help you spot hazards before they turn into real trouble. You can learn more about all these skills at the website and test your hazard recognition know-how with our online quiz. But to develop real-world skills, you need real-world experience. So plan to practice hazard recognition the next time you're on the road. That way, you won't be the one saying, I never even saw it coming. Ready for more real-world driving? This time, our topic is vehicle handling. Something you probably learned about when you were riding one of these. Remember learning how to keep your balance on a curve? How to keep from going over the handlebars when you hit the brakes? How to make adjustments when you switch from one bike size to another? Well, now you've got to learn how to do those same things sitting behind the wheel. Because in the real world... Balance, braking, and adjusting to the vehicle you're driving are essential skills for staying in control on the road. First, balance. And this might surprise you. When it's parked, your vehicle is balanced evenly on four spots where your tires touch the road. These are called contact patches, and each one is about the size of your hand. Not a lot of surface area for a ton or more of plastic, glass, and steel. That's why you need to keep your tires in good condition and inflated at the recommended pressure to drive safely. Watch what happens, though, once you start driving. As you accelerate the weight of your vehicle, the load shifts to the rear and it tips out of balance. The contact patches in the back get slightly bigger, but you lose some contact up front. When you brake or slow down, the balance tips the other way as the load shifts to the front. This time, it's the front contact patches that get bigger while you lose some contact in the back. Turns also upset your vehicle's balance, shifting the load to the outside of the turn. Turn right, and you lose some contact on the right. Turn left, and you lose some contact on the left. Turn too fast or too sharply, and you might lose contact altogether, or even tip over. The important thing is to shift the load gradually, whether you're speeding up, slowing down, or turning. That way, you'll stay in balance and stay in control. Balance and handling are also affected by the type of vehicle you're driving. Take a look at this compact car maneuvering at 50 miles per hour. See the load shift? It still looks pretty easy to keep the car in balance and under control. But now, look at an SUV performing the same maneuver at the same speed. You can see the same load shifts, but now there's more weight being shifted around and it shifts more noticeably because of the vehicle's higher center of gravity. You have to drive more carefully to keep this vehicle in balance and under control. Hey, it's obvious. All vehicles are not created equal, and that's a good thing. We need different kinds of vehicles for all different things we do. But you have to adjust to the vehicle you're driving to stay in control. That means checking the owner's manual for safe way to pack cargo and learning how to handle your vehicle's size and weight. Size and weight make a big difference in braking, too. Watch what happens when a compact car and an SUV both hit the brakes at 60 miles per hour. The SUV travels much farther before it comes to a stop. That's because it's heavier. Same thing with a full-size passenger car or any vehicle with lots of weight. That's why you have to add extra space to your safety zone when you're driving a heavier vehicle on the highway. You know, even the type of brakes you have on your vehicle can affect handling. Some vehicles have conventional brakes which depend entirely on the driver for their stopping power. The harder you press on the brake pedal, the more pressure you apply on the brakes. But today, many vehicles have anti-lock braking systems, called ABS. 
These are computer-assisted brakes designed to help stop your vehicle as fast as possible in an emergency. With ABS, when you stomp on the brake pedal, the computer applies the pressure, making adjustments for speed, road conditions, and all the other factors involved in coming to a quick, safe stop. Check to find out which types of brakes you're driving. And if you have ABS, always check the self-test light on the dashboard to make sure they're operating properly. The light is supposed to go out soon after you start your vehicle. If it doesn't, that means the computer is down and you'll be driving with conventional brakes until you get it fixed. Knowing which type of brakes you have is important because the two systems handle differently when you have to stop quickly. Take a look. ABS brakes are designed to help you handle emergencies. Just stomp, stay, and steer. Stomp on the brake pedal as hard as you can. That alerts the computer to adjust the pressure. And stay on the pedal. Don't worry about any weird noises or vibrations. They're normal. And remember, four-wheel ABS lets you steer while you're braking. So stomp, stay, and if you need to, steer away from trouble. With conventional brakes, you're the one applying the pressure. And in an emergency, that can take real driving skill. You need to apply as much pressure as you can, but not enough to lock the wheels. Again, brace and brake hard, but be ready to ease up just a bit if you hear the tire squeal, and just a bit more if you need to steer. Remember, as you brake, you're shifting the load to the front of your vehicle and gaining traction as those contact patches get bigger. That means you can brake harder as you slow down. Emergency braking is an essential skill, but please don't wait for a real emergency to try out these braking techniques. Get training if you can, then practice making emergency stops in a safe place. Hey, is it just me, or does it seem like the right time for a break? But before we go, though, let's review the vehicle handling skills we've talked about. First, we saw how load shifts affect the balance of a moving vehicle, and why you need to shift the load gradually when you speed up, slow down, or take a turn. Then we looked at some of the ways the type of vehicles you drive can affect handling and saw why it's important to adjust your speed, steering, and braking distance to the vehicle size and weight. Last, we talked about ABS and conventional braking systems and saw how to use each system in an emergency stop. All these skills help you stay in control when you're driving. And according to experts, that could save your life and the life of anyone riding with you. More than 40% of teen driving fatalities are caused by loss of control. That's about 2,000 teen deaths each year. So remember, be in control when you take the wheel. You can learn more about vehicle handling at the website and test your knowledge of these skills with our online quiz. But to develop real world skills, you need real world experience. Try to get training and plan to practice safe vehicle handling the next time you're on the road. We know you can handle it. Do you ever find yourself talking to other drivers when you're on the road? You know, like, hey, watch where you're going, or hey, what's the rush? Or hey, slowpoke, let's move it up there. Listen, save your breath. Those other drivers can't hear you. The only way to protect yourself from other drivers is to put space between them and you. That's why this next segment of our video is all about space management. Think about it. You need space to avoid trouble in almost any driving situation. Space in front and behind when you hit the brakes or need to speed up. Space on the side to swerve away. You even need space when all you can do is honk your horn. Enough space for the other driver to get the message and react before he or she crashes into you. But where can you get all this space? Turns out it's easy, once you know where to look. You can find driving space around you, ahead of you, and even behind you. First look around you and make adjustments to maximize the space between you and the other vehicles on the road. Here's how. Suppose you're cruising down this busy highway with other drivers on all sides. It looks claustrophobic, but by adjusting your speed and position, you can stagger your vehicle in the traffic so you can have extra space in front, behind, and on the side. The important thing here is learning to adjust your speed so you don't find yourself forced to pass other vehicles and don't force other vehicles to pass you. Just stay within the speed limit and drive at a speed that doesn't impede other drivers. In most cases, that means stay to the right unless you're passing. 
especially if you see traffic building up behind you or notice other drivers maneuvering to get by. Remember, you're working with space, not time when you're on the road. And making space for other drivers is the safest way to get the space you need. The most valuable space for any driver is that safety zone ahead of you. Lose ground there and you risk a crash into someone's rear end. But you can stake out the space you need up front by maintaining a safe following distance. Here's how. To check your following distance, pick a landmark up ahead, like a sign, an overpass, or a crosswalk. When the vehicle in front of you goes past it, count the seconds it takes you to reach the same landmark. In city driving, you need at least a two to four second interval between you and the driver in front of you. Remember, only a fool breaks the two to four second rule. It takes at least two seconds to say that, and it's a good way to find out if you're driving smart. At highway speeds, you need at least a six second gap between you and the vehicle you're following. When you're driving on slick roads or in poor visibility, add even more space. You'll be glad to have it. Wait, there's more. We've seen how to manage the space ahead of us. What about the space behind? How can you gain a margin for safety back there? Take another look. Here's what you want to avoid. Getting rear-ended. The driver behind you didn't maintain a safe following distance, and you have to suffer for it. Nearly a million people are injured this way every year, and 2,000 more are killed. You can avoid getting rear-ended by taking precautions. When you see that you have to slow down for a stoplight or stop traffic, check behind you and brake early to let those drivers know it's coming. This signals everyone to start braking, and it gives you extra space up front in case you have to swerve away from a potential rear-ender. Next, when you do stop, give yourself some room to maneuver up front, more than a car length if you can. This space is your escape route in case someone comes flying in behind you, and it's especially important if there's no one there, if any driver who comes on the scene after you're stopped has a clear shot at your rear end. So when you see someone coming, tap on the brakes a couple of times to make sure they see you, too. <laughs> you know what I mean? Even with all these precautions, you can still get rear-ended, so don't forget to adjust your head restraint properly at the start of every drive. The head restraint helps prevent whiplash, the most common type of injury in a rear-end crash. Remember to use it. Okay. We've seen ways to create space around your vehicle, ahead of you, and behind. Now let's find out how to manage space during an emergency. Here's the situation. You're driving on a two-way street. Suddenly, there's a driver headed straight for you. What do you do? It's not a hypothetical question. If you want to survive, you need to know the answer. Need a hint? Think outside the box. Many roadways have space just off the paved surface, called a shoulder. And you can use that space to avoid a head-on collision. Here's how. Slow down, keep your vehicle in balance and under control. Then move partway onto the shoulder, trying to keep two tires on the pavement, and let the other driver squeeze by. When the emergency is passed, you move smoothly back into your lane and think how lucky you were to have seen this video. All joking aside, this is a life-saving maneuver, so we're gonna watch it again. Slow down and stay in control. A smooth move partway onto the shoulder, not a panicky jerk out of the way. The other driver squeezes by and you steer smoothly back to safety. You'll want to practice that move onto the shoulder before you really have to use it. In fact, if you can, get training and practice all the space management skills we talked about. Here's a recap. Stagger your vehicle in traffic to create an extra space around you and drive at a safe speed that doesn't impede other drivers. Maintain a safe following distance to create extra space ahead of you. Brake early to create an escape space so you can avoid an oncoming rear ender. And be ready to steer onto the side of the road to avoid crashing head on. You can learn more about all these skills at the website. And once you're a space ace, take our online quiz. It could be very rewarding. You know, we could make this last segment of our video real short and sweet. Just two words, in fact, that I'm sure you've heard before. Slow down! But in the real world, of course, things aren't that simple. Out here, 
you have to know how to control your speed and how to stay in control. That's why this last part of our video is about speed management skills. We're not talking about high speed driving here. Speed management is all about what you know, not how fast you can go. It takes smarts and depends on knowing the road, letting other drivers know what you're doing, and knowing how to react in emergencies. The first thing you need to know about speed management is this, stay in contact. Your tires and those four small contact patches we talked about are all there is between your vehicle and the road, and anything that reduces that contact could send you skidding out of control. That's why reduced traction on the road surfaces require reduced speeds. Rain, snow, ice, oil slicks, even a heavy mist can make roads unsafe for normal speeds. And watch out for loose stuff too, like sand, gravel, dirt, or even leaves. You need solid contact between your vehicle and the road every minute you're at the wheel. So slow down on any kind of slippery road surface. And slow down when you see one of these too. They're not just roadside decorations. Highway designers put them up to tell you the safe speed for a bend or a twist in the road. In fact, whenever you see a speed sign, you can figure it's there for a good reason. Speed limits are based on road and traffic conditions. They're not just dreamed up. When the road changes, you'll see the speed limit change with it. And you should adjust your speed, up or down, to match the new condition. As we said before, you've got maximum control when you drive at a speed that doesn't impede the flow of traffic. And sometimes that means stepping it up on a high-speed roadway. But it never means breaking the speed limit. Just match your speed to the road conditions and move out of the way if you're on the road with speeders. Now, let's talk about skids. Most skids happen when your vehicle becomes unbalanced and your tires lose contact with the road. If you accelerate too fast into a turn, shifting the load onto your rear tires, the front tires can skid out of control. On the other hand, if you brake too late or too hard in a turn, shifting the load onto your front tires, the rear tires can skid out of control. Obviously, the best way to handle any kind of skid is to avoid it, using the hazard recognition and vehicle handling skills we talked about. Next best is to know what to do, so watch. Skilled drivers use different techniques to recover from the two different kinds of skids. Here's how to recover control in a front wheel skid. First, stop doing whatever you did to cause the skid, whether it's accelerating too fast or steering too aggressively. Next, take your foot off the gas to reduce speed and to restore balance. Don't hit the brakes, since that could tip you out of balance the other way. Instead, just stay focused on where you want the vehicle to go and wait for the steering to return. This is the hard part, because you're probably panicked, but it should only take a fraction of a second, so just hold on. You'll know you've got steering again when you begin to feel that you're heading towards your target. Now gently turn the wheel to keep your vehicle heading in the right direction, and the emergency is over. But next time, remember to slow down. The technique for recovering control in a rear wheel skid depends on your vehicle's power drive. Here's what to do in a vehicle with rear wheel drive. First, stop doing whatever you did to cause the skid, whether it's braking too hard or steering too aggressively, and put both your feet on the floor. Now stay focused on where you want to go and turn the wheel smoothly in that direction. You might feel what's called a reaction skid, when the rear end swings back the other way. Just steer to keep the vehicle headed towards your target. Once your speed drops, you should feel the vehicle stabilized and be able to steer normally. The emergency's over and you're on your way. But remember to slow down next time so this doesn't happen again. You need a different technique if you've got front wheel drive. In that case, here's how to handle a rear wheel skid. First, as always, stop doing whatever you did to cause the skid, whether it's braking too hard or steering too aggressively. Next, focus on where you want to go and gently press on the gas. Remember you've got front wheel drive and your front wheels are still in contact with the road. Gently pressing the gas will shift the load onto the rear and give you more traction back there. Now, as you gently accelerate, turn the wheel smoothly in the direction you want to go. If you feel a reaction skid, just steer to keep the vehicle headed towards your target. Once the vehicle stabilizes, you should be able to steer normally and the emergency is over. Learning to recover control in a skid takes practice. Steering too sharply or turning the wheel too far can actually make the situation more dangerous. That's why this is one driving skill you should not practice on your own. 
No way. You need an instructor who can show you what to do and help you practice these techniques on a training course. So far we talked about managing your own speed. But in the real world, you sometimes need to manage the speed of other drivers too by letting them know what you're doing. Just like you, most other drivers slow down when they see a flashing light ahead. So always remember to use your turn signal. And if you really need to catch their attention, for example, because there's a backup, tap your brakes. You can also signal other drivers to slow down by covering the brake. Just take your foot off the gas and put it on the brake pedal without applying any pressure. Your speed will drop slightly and your brake lights will let other drivers know they should reduce their speed too. Covering the brake also puts you in a perfect position to make a quicker, smoother stop. One last speed management tip, and it's probably the most important one of all, focus. When you're at the wheel, the faster you're traveling, the more focused you have to be. Here's why. Suppose you take your eyes off the roadway for a split second to check your speed. You see that you're going 60 miles per hour, which is five miles per hour under the speed limit for this road, and that's great. But check this out. After you check your speed, it takes time for you to refocus on the road in front of you. And it will take more time for you to react to any hazard you might see there. When you add it all up, that's at least a full second. And at 60 miles per hour, that means you've traveled about 88 feet driving blind. And if the road takes a sudden turn, or if the traffic comes to a sudden stop, well, you get the picture. Focus is the real reason why the best speed management advice for beginning drivers really is to slow down. It takes all the other driving skills we talked about in this video, hazard recognition skills, vehicle handling skills, and space management skills to cope with high speed driving situations. So even when you know how to adjust your speed to the road condition, know how to control the speed of the driver behind you, and know how to react during an emergency, you still need to know the limits of your own driving ability in order to manage speed safely. You can learn more about speed management at the website. And once you studied up, test your knowledge with our online quiz. So that's it. You're ready to become a safe, real-world driver. Just practice the four skill sets we've talked about with a parent or driving instructor, and you'll be on your way to helping reduce the number of teen drivers killed and injured in crashes each year. But please remember, it can happen to you. Sometimes, somewhere, almost every driver is involved in a crash. It happened to me when I was 17 years old. And it happened to me when I was 16. We survived, and with the driving skills we've talked about, you can too. In fact, there's a good chance you can even drive crash-free. So, good luck learning to be a better driver, and we'll see you out on that open road. These four skills that help you off the road could help save your life on the road. To learn more and earn rewards, like free music downloads, visit drivingskillsforlife.com. Think you have driving skills? Take the challenge at drivingskillsforlife.com. Earn rewards like free music downloads. Driving skills for life. I hope you learned a lot from that video, so let's go ahead and talk about your assignment for today. So today you're gonna to be reading chapter 11 and 12 of the Texas Traffic Safety Student Manual. 
Now I went ahead and scanned the entire manual or the entire textbook. It should be available on our website. So go ahead and click on that link and you'll have access to chapter 11 and chapter 12. And then also I want you to go ahead and open up your workbook, which is also found on our website. And I want you to do exercise A for both chapter 11 and 12. Once you're done with those two assignments, go ahead and email me your answers at mrjamesdriverz at gmail.com. And I'll see you tomorrow.